Public speaking can be a challenge, especially for technical people who love to get lost in the details, like yours truly. Luckily, my guest on this show knows how to give a great presentation, whether it's via video conference, in person to your team, or at a keynote in front of thousands. And she'll be sharing her secrets on this episode of Dynamic Developer. I'm your host, Bill Detweiler, and this week I'm talking to Heidi Waterhouse. She's a developer advocate for Launch Darkly, as well as a writer and skilled public speaker. And she's here to share her advice for developers, IT pros, and other technical professionals who want to grow their presenting and public speaking skills. Heidi, thanks for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here virtually. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're all virtual these days. Um, and that's what we're really here to talk about, right, is how under this kind of new normal with remote work, with teleconferencing, um, you know, how do we design presentations as someone who talks to a lot of people, delivers presentations? How, how do you do that in, in this kind of new normal? Um, but before we get there, I thought it would be a really cool place to start um, uh, to talk a little bit about your uh, role as a developer advocate, right? You know, it's something that a, a lot of software uh, tool development companies have, and but maybe, you know, people listening don't really understand what that role kind of entails, or they think everyone comes into the role with the same kind of background. So, and, you know, because I think that's so critical to sort of your role as a communicator um, and, you know, working with a communicator, I think that's really cool. Um, so how did you get started uh, as a developer advocate? What, what brought you into this role? The vast majority of developer advocates, if you ask us, how we started doing this? The answer is we fell into it sideways. And the same is true for me. I spent 20 years as an extremely technical, technical writer using my English degree to do stuff about uh, crypto, not crypto mining, cryptology uh, and security and um, large scale networks and stuff like that. And so I had all of this really deep understanding, but a few years into my career, I realized that one of the things I really wanted to be doing was scaling myself better and making a better use of my time rather than just writing these one-off uh, books that only a small percentage of people were ever going to see and a smaller percentage were going to read. I wanted to be doing something that had more impact. And so I started doing public speaking at conferences. And I talked about like how to do technical writing. I have some talks out there about if you're a developer who's being forced to do technical writing, what do you do? And as I kept doing this, I applied for a job at LaunchDarkly as a writer, and they looked at my conference experience, and they're like, you don't want to be a writer. You want to be a developer advocate. I said, what's a developer advocate? And they're like, well, it's the person who talks to developers for us and talks for developers to us. So a, a developer advocate is a human API. I am the application programming interface for developers on two sides of this like artificial wall of what is a company to get information to each other. So when I go talk to people, even if I'm not going, when I talk to people, I bring back information for my product team, for my development team and say, hey, uh, you know, how are we feeling about doing a Flutter thing? Like I'm, I'm getting a real uptick in questions about Flutter as an SDK. And they'll, you know, add it to the list. And then I have also the responsibility to go out and say, hey, we have, you know, these, these 19 SDKs. Would you like to hear about them? And that gives us a chance to have a conversation. But I'm also like on the broad scale representing Launch Darkly because whatever company you're with, you become the public face in a different way than the founders or the CEOs. You're the person that gets the random DMs in the middle of the day saying, hey, this isn't really a support question, but uh, I was wondering if, you know, and, and then you're going to get that kind of question. And it is my job to be present for those questions, which is super interesting. Um, and has been a really engaging part of my work. I've been 
a full-time remote worker for north of 10 years. Every once in a while I try going back to the office again and I don't like it. Um, it's really hard to do deep work for me in an office um, because there are keywords floating around all the time and then I pay attention to the keyword and, and then my, my train of thought is lost. So how does someone who's technical like yourself, and, and I can identify with that, you know, I didn't start with a background in journalism um, and tech media, all I've been doing it for 20 years, like yourself, I had a technical background, right? And I think there's a, there's a, how do you make that transition from someone who does sort of really technical writing or comes from a technical background, whether it's, um, I was an engineering mathematics and computer science person in college and an IT background, a developer background or a coder. How does someone with that technical kind of background prepare for doing these kind of events, live presentations, whether it's on a grand scale at a conference, whether it's standing up and doing a keynote presentation or, or whether it's just within your own company, right? Just standing up in front of a group uh, at a stand up or at a product demo. How, how do you do that in a way that um, is effective and is, um, you know, helps communicate the message to the, and, en and engaging with the audience, right? I think uh, the first thing I'd say is start small. Like, uh, please don't try and start with a conference talk or even if you haven't done it all, a meetup talk. There, there's like an escalation level um, that I think we don't talk enough about. There's like standing up at, at stand up, there's doing an all hands demo. Then there's like doing a small meetup. There's doing a small conference at a multi, small talk at a multi-track conference. There's doing a talk at a single track conference. Like th there's this whole escalation. And a lot of the levels above Meetup are a, not a different skill set, but like a skill set that you would need to focus on and work on. Like you have to learn to do a CFP. You have to learn to uh, put together a slide deck. You have to learn to like, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. And so that's sort of a separate question. But I think to start out, the things that you need to understand are that everybody in the audience is on your side. Like a lot of people uh, give this really old speaking advice about imagine your audience naked and then you don't respect them anymore. And I think that's that's terrible on several levels. Please don't, please don't imagine anybody naked. Um, what I want you to do is imagine that they are sitting in this meeting because they wanna hear from you. They want you to succeed. And if you have a problem, they're empathizing with the problem. Like we've all seen that thing where a presenter's computer goes dark and they're like, okay, the audience is pulling for you. And so when you remember that the audience is mostly on your side, I think it helps a lot with the stage fright. And the other thing that I think is super important um, that I've had sort of like vaguely throughout my life an understanding of, but um, was really solidified when I read Badass, Making Users Awesome by Kathy Sierra. Nobody is here to use software. We're here to communicate with each other. We're here to get a job done. Software is sort of the necessary middleware between humans. And the way that we get people to engage with what we're saying is not tell them how to use the software, but tell them how to get what they need done, done. So it's gonna be a much more compelling story. If, if I came in and told you about a bunch of webcam settings and like DSLR and, and all sorts of like technical things, it would be very satisfying in an I'm learning something way, but it wouldn't necessarily teach you about what you're trying to do. How difficult is that a transition for highly technical people to make? You know, they love to talk about features and wow, we put all this work into making this button work this way. And there's, there's hours of work behind the scenes, but the person that you're talking to really just wants to know, Hey, if I click this, it does this. And that's really what I wanted. Whoa. Yay. Great. So there's an apocryphal Einstein quote that says, if you can't explain it to an eight-year-old, you don't understand it. 
And I think that's sort of like a, a good North Star is to say, you know, mommy, what do you do at work? Um, it's, it's a really a different question. Uh, I think the way that a lot of developers can access this and don't think to do it is they need to talk to their product design team because the product design team has a finger on the pulse of who is the user and what are they trying to do. And that gets filtered through like, okay, now I've written a story, now it's an epic, now we've broken it down into like technical details, but you need to go back to the source and say, what is the user trying to do? Um, we're, we're doing an integration right now and I had a really interesting discussion with my developers because they're like, well, of course people will start in our software and then do this other thing to integrate. And I'm like, no, 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 no. The software that we're integrating with owns the world. Everybody starts their day in that software and our integration has to be seamless and invisible to the vast majority of people who use it. That's what would make it useful. Nobody wants to go use our software. Um, like, I, I totally want it to power the world underneath. I want the integrators to know about it. But from a story perspective, I need you to understand that we are working in somebody else's sandbox. So what mistakes do you see people uh, make when they prepare for um, giving a presentation? You talked about starting small um, and you talked about, so, you know, we, we've talked about um, being able to convey the message without sort of going into too much technical detail, solving people's real problems. What, what other mistakes do you see people make uh, when they're preparing for a presentation? On a, on a technical level, you need fewer words on your slides. Uh, the human brain literally cannot listen and read at the same time. Like we just, like I know you think you can, I know you were doing it in the back of like, you know, whatever boring class you were in, you were reading a book and sort of listening to the teacher. Uh, that's very rapid switching and not actually multitasking. Those are the same brain center. Uh, so if you put words on your slide, people are gonna read the words and stop listening to what you're saying. Uh, so the way I solve this, and I think this is especially useful for web presentations, is none of my fonts are less than 36 point. Um, you can only fit so many words on a slide if you have this, this artificial constraint. Um, and so that means that you don't get those slides that are just bullet points that the presenter reads, um, because those are really terrible to sit through. Like you could have bullet points that are like one or two words so that as a presenter you remember what you were going to say but don't write it all out um the way that slides are showing up in video conferences means that we need to change how we design slides um most of our slide templates like the the stock templates that you get from either your designer or your software are designed for presentation in a room of like 12 people that's, that's sort of what they're optimized for. They're optimized for a meeting. Um, but when you get that next to somebody's talking head uh, in a window that's been squinched over so that people can still see their notifications, uh, you're talking a very small slide footprint. So your fonts have to be big, your pictures have to be clear, and if you're doing attribution on your slides, which I think is really important, like all of my slides have my Twitter handle on them, so that people can quote me accurately and take screen caps. Uh, if you're doing attribution, it needs to be bigger than it would if you were doing it for like a conference screen. Uh, so that's, that's number one mistake. The number two mistake is you don't practice. And believe me, I know how horrible it is to watch yourself talk. Um, I hate it. I hate it every time I've been doing this for seven years and every time I record myself giving a talk or watch a conference recording of myself giving a talk, I'm just like, I can't believe I did that. I sound like such a dip. Okay. Um, however, just like every other iteration, this is your test. And if you don't test, then you don't know that you're actually delivering what you think you're delivering and you can't iterate. So you have to practice, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it sucks. Um, when, I, when I'm starting off new speakers, I say go home, have a few drinks. If you're in California, maybe have something a little greener. Um, whatever it takes to get yourself relaxed 
so that you can watch this. And then just watch it through once um, and you'll know things. And you don't have to like sit there taking notes about everything you did wrong. In fact, I think that's kind of destructive. Um, but you do need to run this test on how your presentation is coming across. So I really wish people would do that pre-test before they release to public, like who does testing after release. Um, all of us. <laughs> but uh, the thing that I wish is that if you know you have a big presentation coming up, you would set up your webcam, you can record your own Zoom meeting, you know, go through it, it will be super awkward, um, but it will make the next one better. I refer to this stage as getting the suck out. Like every talk has a finite amount of suck and uh, I'm either going to suck on stage or I'm going to suck in test. And I know which one I'd rather. You know, you mentioned something right there that I think is really important, especially now, but you know, with the growth in remote work uh, is still important, which is preparing for your venue. You know, so whether you're doing something virtually, whether you're doing something in a small meeting room or whether you're doing something on a keynote stage in front of a thousand people. Now, since those last two, no one's really doing now, um, let, let's talk about virtual. You, you talked about um, a, a few bullet, you know, a few important points, which is, you know, changing the slide layout. What else do people really need to do to prepare for virtual presentations? So you need to think about your slides as being a very small part of the screen. Uh, you need better lighting. Um, this is the number one problem that I see people have. And you and I both look okay because this is what we do. Well, and, and in all fairness, I did bring home um, nice studio lights. <laughs> so at least one or two nice studio lights. And like, so I'll, you know, caveat there, uh, not everybody has that, but right. you don't really have to, do you? You, you don't. Like, um, so I actually, I invested a little bit um, in a green screen and it came with some nice diffuser lights, which is basically an LED with a, a, a transparent, not transparent, a translucent white umbrella in front of it. And that's what's off to this side. But also I just have a desk lamp pointed up at my ceiling, um, which is white. So it bounces white light down. Uh, and those are things that like I had around that I, I put together ad hoc. Um, I'm, I'm really amused. There's a bunch of, there's this phenomenon and it's, it's not just developers, but it shows up so clearly in developers where the, the way to solve a problem is a, a new exciting tool. So a bunch of my developer advocate friends have gone to, what if I get a high-end DSLR with a fixed uh, camera or fixed, fixed link lens and I use the dummy battery and run the HDMI into my mixer and I'm like, my friends, this is the thing that you were doing when you were like, I'm going to start blogging as soon as I get my static site generator fixed. <laughs> that's not, that's not the point. Please just write the blog post. Please just do the webcam. Um, I recommend people actually don't invest a ton in cameras uh, because the higher quality your camera is, the more unforgiving it is. Um, if you get a 4K camera, you will realize that everybody on TV is wearing makeup and not just makeup, but flawlessly applied makeup. Like it's a whole different makeup game than when we had earlier video cameras. And so like, don't, don't get too caught up in the stuff. Like, make sure you have good lighting. Um, think about who you're going to talk to, do your best on the audio. But I actually, I, I'm using a, an external mic right now, but it was like a hundred dollars. Um, and you can't order them right now because everybody's working from home. Like you can't, you can't order anything right now in this, the sixth week of lockdown. Uh, but your webcam is going to work fine. Your webcam probably has a mic on it that's slightly better than using your, your computer's mic. Go with that. Um, the other preparation that I think people really need to be aware of is bandwidth. Um, <laughs> this is a consistent problem. Uh, you can't see, but there is a um, janky uh, ethernet cable running across the back of my office uh, because I ran ethernet and then I moved my office. Uh, you need a hardwire if you can do it at all. 
because that's going to give you priority. But uh, if you have kids, they're home from school, they're taking classes, they're also on the bandwidth. Um, make them stay on Wi-Fi. You get the wire. <laughs> Anybody who's making money gets top billing for, for whatever internet you have. Uh, pay for as much internet as you can get. Um, and like before I came downstairs, I'm like, hey, I have an interview. Uh, be light on the bandwidth. Like don't like if you cannot be visible on the zoom don't send the video um but the bandwidth wars this happens to me every summer when they come home and i'm like oh, where did all of my fast go um but i think it's it's fair if you have the the expertise and the problems to set up lockouts that say like you know anybody earning money gets 50 percent of the bandwidth and everybody else has to split the other 50 percent you know what advice would you give to either developers or other technical people who maybe want to do more public speaking? You know, especially now, you know, in terms of as we, you know, look at the future economic kind of uncertainty, a lot of people may be reassessing their careers. What if, or just looking to sort of upskill and say, I think this would be a really great way to promote myself, my work, sort of get out in front of people. What would you say, I know, I know you come from, don't come from a developer background, but with that highly kind of technical background, you know, we, I, I don't know if anyone really starts out in public speaking, you know, we've talked about advice, but what advice would you give to maybe developers who want to look at that or other technical IT folks who want to kind of take that leap? I think first I'd say, you know, research the field. Look at some stuff that you know is going to be really excellent. Like the TED Talks are beautifully produced and extremely well put on and rehearsed to within an inch of their lives. If you watch a TED Talk, whoever is doing that has given that talk a hundred times in practice, um, which sounds unbelievable. Um, but yeah, no, I totally believe that. Uh, so watch the good stuff and also watch stuff at like the level that you might be able to approach. Watch some Twitch streams. There's a ton of live coding Twitch streams out now and you can start to detect what your style might be. So you're going to say, oh, okay, like this person um, talks through their problem and also keeps identifying what they're trying to solve or this person's really good at debugging and I want to be like that. So you're gonna look at sort of the, the two ends of formality and see which end you tend toward. Uh, I'm, because I'm trained as a speaker, uh, I, like, I can't imagine giving a talk sitting down. I can't imagine doing a webinar sitting down uh, because it changes your energy. And uh, I find it really difficult to do all of these talks to just a web camera because I'm used to having an audience that will react to me. I put a stuffed animal on top of my web camera so I can make eye contact with it <laughs> because that, that makes it easier for me. But if you're a developer just starting out, I want you to know you don't, you don't have to be perfect. Like if you look at some of your favorite YouTube channels, like pretty much every developer I know has some YouTube channel that they, they follow. Um, when they're starting out, their camera work is shaky and their scripting is off and you're sort of like, oh, that's not the guy I'm used to. But like, if you go back to like the very early roles of uh, Smarter Every Day, it's not bad, but it's definitely not like the production values that get you a, a shot where you get to fly in a jet, right? And so just like everything else in our development life cycle, we're gonna keep iterating. So don't be scared to start off with what you have. Don't be scared. Um, like, what, what's the failure case of putting out a little, like, here's how I, here's how I describe uh, private public encryption. Okay, there are a lot of explanations. I really like the one with the paint colors. Um, there's a really good one about eh, public-private key uh, encryption on, that, that involves mixing paint. Um, but like, however you describe that, it could be five minutes. Put it out, see what people think. Watch it yourself. See if you agree with what they're saying. Uh, you're not gonna get a lot of viewers at first. That's an advantage. Uh, because sometimes it's, it's good to start with like just doing this for myself or 
a couple of my friends or whichever coworker I can coerce into pretending they watched it, you know, whatever. But I think we don't want to say to developers, to technical people, you have to be as good as, you know, Heidi who gets paid to professionally deliver keynotes. Like that is literally my job is getting up on stage and doing the thing so that you're all inspired about uh, disasters. This was my last keynote. Um, instead, what we're paying you for is to understand interesting things. And if you can explain it to the next person, then you've really added to your value as a developer because we've all worked with that developer who's brilliant and can't tell you what they're doing. And I don't want to work with that person as much as I want to work with the person who's like three quarters brilliant and can actually describe what's going on. Well, well, Heidi, I, I think that's great advice. Um, you know, I, and I think that's a perfect place uh, to, uh, to, to stop. Um, where can folks go more, uh, to learn about, uh, what you're doing, the work there at launch, uh, darkly and, and maybe, uh, see some of your work and learn from it. I have a website at HeidiWaterhouse.com that has all of my recordings up on it. Uh, launchdarkly.com. Uh, we have a free trial for 30 days. What we're doing is feature management as a service or I like to say feature flags as a service. So don't roll it yourself. Let us do it for you because we're going to do it better. Uh, I, I have actually a whole talk called free as in puppies <laughs> about build versus buy. Like, sure, it's free. You can build it yourself like a free puppy. But yeah, you could go there. Uh, we'd, we'd welcome you for a trial. And I think it's really exciting to, to get to be here and talk about this. And you can listen to more episodes of Dynamic Developer on your favorite podcast platform or watch a video of each episode as well as read a transcript at Tech Republic. <laughs>